Welcome to another online training by the Animal Resistance University. Uh, this talk is part of a series about intersectionality and inclusivity and will introduce you to what intersectionality is and how it can apply to our work within animal rights. My mom was a political activist in the 80s in Turkey during the clash of left and right, uh, and she was jailed during that time. Uh, after one, two years of torture and um, uh, this kind of experience, she did uh, get out of jail, but she was going to be jailed again because she continued to do activism. Uh, and this is the time when she decided that she needed to get away uh, from Turkey. So she took herself a fake passport. Uh, she went to Germany. And uh, after approximately one year, she gave birth to me. Uh, so this is the context as, that I was born into. Uh, I'm seeing notifications in the chat, but you are checking, right? Okay. Awesome. Uh, so what kind of experience was this? Um, I was so basically the daughter of a Turkish person in Germany, which in itself is not necessarily an easy experience. Uh, my mom was also a single mom uh, and she was a political, illegal political refugee. Uh, not speaking the language of the country that she was in, with no financial security. Um, and from being an electrical engineer in Turkey, she actually went to become a struggling cleaning lady in Germany. Uh, and this was basically my life for 10 years, uh, after which my mom's case uh, in Turkey was dropped uh, and she was able to return to Turkey. And so basically she took me with her. Um, so after 10 years, this transition was an experience much beyond just a geographical change. Uh, and I think this is the core reason of why I believe so strongly in a pro-intersectional approach. Uh, when I went to Turkey, I realized actually that people on television uh, or superstars or doctors or lawyers or book covers, uh, the people featured in them actually for the first time did look similar to me. Uh, and I think this was a realization of the discrimination that I was putting up with that I wasn't even aware. And I think this shows us very dramatically how even when you're not on the safe side of, side of privilege, you start taking your worthlessness absolutely for granted. Um, and so this entire experience, like I said, uh, actually led me to study social science and so political science to understand these dynamics uh, to a better degree. And so after approximately 15 years, I returned to Germany. Um, and that is now three years ago, approximately to work in the animal rights movement. And it's very interesting that what I experienced almost 30 years ago did change to some degree, but not a lot. So for example, when I am personally in Germany walking around, a lot of people will tell me that I do not look Turkish at all. Uh, and to a big degree, this is uh, a compliment in some people's understanding. Um, and the simple reason for that, I think, is that in Germany, people are more used to seeing Turkish people who are at the absolute bottom uh, of the social economical state uh, level. And uh, I think they're not used to seeing someone who has not experienced discrimination for almost a decade. And so I want to give you a last example of why it came that for me, intersectionality and animal rights went hand in hand. Uh, when I came to Germany, I went uh, straight to an AV cube. And I, this was actually my first cube ever. And I was told to hold uh, the laptop and to wear a mask. And it was actually very fascinating to see that in this particular location that we chose at, maybe partly that was also the reason, but the people who stood in front of the laptop, who were almost crying and strongly identified were Syrian refugees. And I thought that was actually, the, actually incredible. And I think this made for me the connection very clear of sometimes we, underestimate how some groups can identify with the animal rights or vegan movement. But in fact, I think oppressed people have a tendency to be able to empathize with the feeling of being unheard by wider society. And I thought that was a very interesting experience. The second one on the very same day, 
uh, was that, like I said, I'm wearing a mask and I'm holding the laptop and I have an outreacher in front of me. And so someone was passing by and this person stopped and the outreacher and uh, this person were talking and the conversation wasn't the most successful. Uh, the person who came looked Middle Eastern and also had an accent that you would say maybe is somewhere from the region. And he said something like, sorry, I like meat too much. And he left. The outreacher, not knowing who I am, turned to me and said, well, you know how it is with people from that region. <laughs> uh, I'm not trying to say that the vegan movement is racist or sexist or ableist. These kinds of mistakes are not unique to animal rights and they're also not new to animal rights. This happens all the time. Um, but that is historically and socially, like I say, not uncommon, but it definitely needs uh, work. Um, are there any questions so far? Uh, nothing in the chat, but there's something now, Geoffrey. Ah, uh, no, the, he, he replied when you said uh, um, that people, people talk to you like, oh, you don't look Turkish. He said, uh, well, that's so, that's so wrong. So that was, that was his uh, um, response to that. And then there was some discussion. It was All right. more like clarification. Okay. You look beautiful would be better, he says. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. So let's see. Um, what is intersectionality? Now, I think sometimes talking about this topic is a bit challenging because in, within the animal rights movement, at least, we're not all talking the same language. Uh, some people have an academic degree in this field. Some people have absolutely never heard of it. And I guess for me personally and for this talk, what I really want to achieve is that it's not boring for either side and that at least everybody can understand the concept. And so this is why we are going to go a little bit into the basics but also go a little bit more into detail. So we, I will try to have a balance here and I'm going to assume uh, hopefully that there are some people in the call who do identify with intersectionality, but also don't uh, because the, this talk is going to literally target both, both of you. So intersectionality, uh, it's a rather recent trend uh, that we use this word within animal rights. Uh, and that we discuss this in animal rights. But the term is not necessarily new. Uh, it actually roots, uh, its roots are in um, the black feminist movement. And the term was coined by the person you see on your screen, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw um, in 1989. Uh, not that the phenomenon was new, but that was when the uh, phenomenon became a name, uh, got a name. Uh, I think this can be imagined similarly to how Melanie Joy termed and coined the term carnism to an existing phenomenon and so intersectionality as a word was born. Why was that necessary? Uh, I'm going to give you an example that I think is going to really make you understand why it was really important to talk about this and this example is from the 1960s approximately, 1970s maybe, uh, where General Motors was sued uh, by five black women. Uh, to put this into context, General Motors didn't have a single person of color uh, in their company until 1964. And actually in 1970, they fired absolutely all of them. Um, and so five black women sued General Motors and said they were discriminatory and they were not hiring these women because they were black women. And this went to court and the judge looked at the case and the judge said, well, um, this is not really a valid accusation because General Motors clearly has black people and clearly has women. And so this is not really true. The problem though, was that there were actually black men in General Motors doing industrial work and white women doing the job of a secretary, leaving no space for black women. And so the idea is that feminism alone, anti-racism alone, is often not enough to explain a dynamic that somebody is experiencing. Why? Because we have more than one identity. And so approaches to building equality, like I said, they tend to focus on only one discrimination. So for example, racism will only address that specific concern. Uh, but 
in reality, social systems are really complicated and we can have more than one identity and we can also belong to more than one social group. And so this means that one individual can experience speciesism, sexism, ageism at the very same time. And so it's not just as simple as adding up different oppressions uh, and addressing them individually. When combined, they actually are enhanced to a degree that the experience of oppression is very different. And so intersectionality is the understanding that multiple forms of inequality can overlap and create disadvantages that feminism alone, anti-racism alone, is not really able to uh, tackle. And so what does intersectionality do? It is an essential framework to examine privilege and power and then to take measurable actions like for example, inclusion. And so let's see, this is basically what Crenshaw did in 1989, and this is what the meaning originally was, right? But we're talking here about animal rights. So how does this relate to us? Like, what would it mean to take Crenshaw's definition and apply it to animal rights? Now, normally and technically speaking, I wanna give you an example, and that would be the example, for example, of a pit bull. A pit bull experiences racism because pit bulls are perceived to be more aggressive because of their race. That is racism. And let's say the pit bull bit someone and it is decided that the pit bull needs to be put to sleep. And that is actually the experience of speciesism. We feel entitled to kill an animal because we think this animal is dangerous. And so the pit bull is, is experiencing racism and speciesism at the same time. Another example, and these are not the easiest examples and we can argue about them later, but for example, a female cow. A female cow exploited for dairy is experiencing speciesism and sexism at the same time. Or maybe the fact that men are expected to hunt or eat meat can be also seen as an intersection of speciesism and sexism. The fact that slaughterhouse workers come from socially, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds can also uh, lead to the conclusion that speciesism can also be racist. But do we actually use this term intersectionality this way? Not really. I think those who are familiar with intersectionality do not focus on this specific phenomenon of racism intersecting with speciesism, of uh, ageism intersecting with speciesism. That is not actually what intersection, those who identify themselves as intersectionals uh, use it for. Um, so what, what people do use it for, I think, is a general conception that all oppressions are bad. This is a definition that I think is most commonly used within animal rights. When, when someone says, I'm an intersectional, I'm a pro-intersectional, what they tend to try to say is that they think all oppressions are simply morally wrong. What some people do think, and is actually not accurate, is that intersectionality says that all oppressions are the same. And I want to highlight that here because intersectionality does not say that all oppressions are the same. Because discriminating against black people and eating animals cannot and will never be the same. They say all oppressions are unique and they have their own dynamics and overlapping them is going to enhance the experience. And so this is why, for example, being white and homeless and being black and homeless is never going to be the same, right? Or being, for example, young and poor or being senior and poor cannot and can never be considered the same. So they're not saying the same, but we can agree that the idea is that all oppressions are wrong. And I'm going to continue this talk by generally using the term intersectionality in this context that not that intersections of speciesism and sexism, for instance, but more as the understanding that all oppressions are morally wrong. And so when applied, this understanding when applied to animal rights, what does it mean? Like we said, 
Intersectionals think that sexism, racism, ableism, ageism, xenophobia are bad. They're wrong. And the second thing that they will argue in this context is that when we do animal rights work, when we do animal rights advocacy, when we do activism, when we fight for against one oppression, that we please do not contribute to another one. You know, and these two concepts are really important. That is basically the expectation of someone who says I'm an intersectional vegan. And trust me when I say that this is really relevant because feminism has a history of being racist. Anti-racism actually has a history of being homophobic and gay rights actually has a history of being transphobic. And so this is something that really needs to be considered and we have to be careful that veganism doesn't make the same mistake, right? And so the expectation is that veganism doesn't become sexist, that veganism doesn't become racist. And maybe most importantly also that veganism doesn't become classist, which is I think sometimes a, actually a big problem that is often uh, not really handled. One sec, sorry. Uh, All right, so uh, we said intersectionality tries to shine light on the forms of oppression that need to be considered in order for us to be morally consistent, right? And so if exploiting dogs is just as bad as exploiting cows, then exploiting humans is just as bad as exploiting animals, right? And some clarity around the definitions before I move further. So why do we sometimes say intersectional, but then some other times pro-intersectional? Uh, the reason behind that is that intersectionality, like I say, originates in the black feminist movement and was used to describe the experience of a black woman. And so sometimes people will say that it's not really fair uh, to take this term and to apply it in a way that actually was never really agreed upon. Uh, Crenshaw, for example, is usually comfortable with this concept being taken into other isms and oppressions as well. Uh, but Crenshaw is not a vegan. And so there are also some black uh, female feminists who will say that they don't wanna use intersectional because Crenshaw isn't vegan. So there are different reasons why people will not say that, but they will prefer I'm pro-intersectional, meaning I'm not a black woman, but I understand the concept and I wanna apply that to my activism. And so I'm gonna say pro-intersectional instead. Some people say, it doesn't really make sense because intersectionality means there should be intersections of speciesism and sexism when we describe our problem. Not that all oppressions are wrong. And so what do some people do? They will say, I believe in consistent anti-oppression. I think there needs to be some clarity around these definitions because maybe sometimes we're talking about the same thing, but we're using different words. Um, so eventually, maybe throughout the years, we're going to come to a conclusion. From my experience, this is still not really clear. Someone says I'm pro-intersectional. The other one says I believe in consistent anti-oppression and they're talking about the exact same thing. Uh, let's see what happens in the future. Now, I, I wanna do a little experiment. And uh, this is actually specifically for those who do not feel that they agree with intersectionality, at least not yet. Um, and so I'm going to read a few statements and I want everybody to, when they hear it or read it, that you think about if you agree with this or if you disagree with this. And then at the end, uh, I would love to know if the agreement was much stronger or more disagreement. Maybe you can put it in the chat if you like. Okay, let's start. You are against the oppression and exploitation of non-human animals. In your activism, you do focus on the animals. You focus on the animals, but you are aware that what animal agriculture does to your health and the environment is also bad. You understand these issues as well. You think all sentient beings have the capacity to suffer and that their suffering matters. You find it inconsistent to love dogs and cats, but then to eat farmed animals. You would try to convince someone who advocates against fur to also consider the other ways we exploit animals. 
You think animals deserve a movement that focuses on them. Once upon a time, you enjoyed your human privilege, but you questioned it and then you challenged it. And before that, you were unaware of it. Sometimes it angers you and frustrates you when people deny that animals should be taken into moral cons consideration. You would, you would find it more consistent if environmentalists were also vegan. You think environmentalists could still focus on environmental activism while being vegan and being more informed about animal rights in general. You would love it if people who eat plant-based for health reasons also understood the ethical issue behind it. You want the whole world to be vegan and not just Europe. And you really hope that China and India and Denmark and Afghanistan and Italy and Turkey and Nepal and Mexico and Russia and all of the other countries go vegan as well. You think everyone should join and feel welcome in the animal rights movement. Now, these are statements that are in line with the pro-intersectional idea. And I'm highlighting this because a lot of people will say, oh, I'm not intersectional. In fact, intersectionality is harming the movement because my work is animal centric. That is not something that disagrees with intersectionality. You know, a lot of vegans will say, yeah, well, we need to be consistent. We cannot just advocate against fur. Dogs matter as well. We should be consistent. We shouldn't be just a single issue activist. Yes, this is something that every intersection will agree with. You know? And so this is for me a way for people, especially who disagree, to actually be like, this doesn't disagree with intersectionality. It doesn't. In fact, it strengthens it. And so you see, for example, the connection between agriculture and different issues such, such as environmental justice and health issues, right? Like you focus on the animals, but you see a connection and you are aware of the intersection of these issues. You focus on the animal, but you, and you're mainly in it for the animals, but you use your knowledge around these issues because when you do outreach and you talk to someone unlikely to be interested in animals, you go from the environmental angle, you go from the health angle, right? And so you are aware that you need this information to be confident or knowledgeable and fact-based and sometimes also effective, right? And so you, you're aware it actually works and that those issues are also a huge part of animal rights. Actually, let me see. Oh, yeah. Uh, here are the four points that I'm actually going to talk about now. And so by acknowledging these intersections, and being informed about them, uh, you're already making use of the intersectional approach, right? If you acknowledge the relationship between speciesism and climate justice, between spe speciesism and food justice, if you consider these doing your outreach and make use of them, you are technically already pro-intersectional. At least you understand the concept of including intersect intersections into your activism. And the message of pro-intersectional thinking is not to focus on all causes equally necessarily. I mean, you can focus on the animals, but you have to be aware of other sufferings and human suffering as well. So just like environmentalists can do their environmental uh, advocacy and still be vegan at the same time, you as well, whatever activism you do, you don't have to contribute to the suffering of others. And so the expectation is that you inform yourself, it doesn't cost anything, and what you will have as a result is to be aware of an oppression that you weren't aware of, and you will no longer contribute to it. You also care about consistency, right? So you, like I said, you don't like the single issue of thinking anyway, right? You, you, if you love a dog, why would you eat a cow? You care about this consistency, cons consistency deeply. And so you say it yourself, right? They feel pain just like us, you know, or nobody is free until we're all free. And so while valuing one being more than the other is something that we're already against, right? 
And so that is another message of the priority sectional perspective. It wants you to acknowledge that beings suffer and they deserve to be seen regardless of their ethnicity, age, and species as well. And lastly, you want a vegan world, right? Not just a vegan Europe. And that is exactly why pro-intersectionality and the perspective of diversity and inclusion is extremely important. The animal rights movement needs to include everyone and be applicable to everyone if we want to convert the whole global population. Right? And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. So what's, um, uh, sec, let me see if I have to go to the next slide. Ah, sorry. Uh, and last point, uh, solidarity, right? I mean, we all understand that solidarity with those who need it most is something that will get us to our goal much faster. And so maybe we understand this value more than anyone. And so we can set an example of showcasing that we care and acknowledge other forms of oppressions as well. So what all forms of oppression have in common is that one group of people or one species is considered as having less value than the other, mostly for arbitrary reasons. And we would set an example to others uh, of being pioneers of solidarity, right? And so I suggest that even those who say that they don't agree with intersectionality, uh, that you actually do agree, because how can you actually not? It's most likely rooted in a misconception of what it means, right? And I feel like usually, and I probably think most of you here agree that veganism seems really silly to those who don't get it. And there are a lot of intelligent people in this world who don't get it. But veganism is important. Animal rights is important. And it's the same with climate change, right? It's a joke to those who don't know and who don't look into it. And racism and sexism as well, they're unimportant to those who don't see it and don't acknowledge it. Uh, Aisha, do you want to take some questions or comments? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because I think some people uh, responded to, you know, the questions that you that you asked. So, for example, um, well, one person said, yeah, I agree uh, to all these questions. And then uh, Michael says, I think I am pro-intersectional. So that I think is both based on the questions, but look forward to comments from others. So maybe there are people that, you know, don't agree to all these questions or I don't know if people want to share something. Yes, please. That'd be cool. Please put an X in the chat if you want some to share something or just write your comment in the chat. Don't be shy, you can disagree. Yeah. Like I myself also in agreed to all the questions. So there's uh, Nella who has an X. So Nella, please uh, say something if you want. Yes, hi, uh, I have a question. Uh, of course, I'm pro-intersectionality, uh, but talking to people very often, I realize that uh, intersectionality has a bad name in a way. Mm. So I'm talking to people that I, I know that are active in other areas, um, apart from animal rights, that are doing serious work for refugees, for example, here in Greece, who would never um, say something oppressive or... Um, negative against another race or ethnicity or whatever, but they deny to use uh, the term intersectionality. And these are uh, animal rights activists. And that was a problem in the, um, in the group I work, with, uh, I work with in Greece for animal rights. It was a huge debate if we should use the uh, term intersectionality or no. So we ended up describing it. And I really cannot, I don't know if you have some insight to it, I really cannot understand why people are so, um, so afraid of this word. Yeah. Uh, that's all. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if this is a question or a comment because I don't really have an answer. It's exactly true what you say. In terms of the name being unpopular, I guess the same goes for veganism. I guess the same was and still is true for feminism as well. Uh, they tend to have a clash in... Uh, using the term or not using the term. I guess intersectionality has something extra on top of it because some people also say it's black feminists who used to use this word. Uh, it doesn't apply to our work. I think there are a lot of academics who say we shouldn't use the word. I just spoke yesterday to Christopher Sebastian. He said he doesn't identify as pro-intersectional. He thinks we shouldn't say this actually. Um, 
I can only confirm what you say, honestly. Yeah, I just wanted to, to, to say if, if this is a Greek thing or international thing. That's why I ask. I, get... happens, I just wanted to check if it happens only in my country mm. or if it is an international thing. That, that was why uh, I asked you. Ah, thank you. I think it's international. If, some, in, if there's someone in the country where this is not the case, please let me know. <laughs> I'm <laughs> <Thank> coming. <laughs> yeah, I think this is, a, this is a general problem. Some people will say the word is too negative and it's been overused and we should move to another word. That's an option. Uh, I personally go from the road of, you know what, we have spoken so much about intersectionality. So many people by now have heard of it. We have done so much work. We can now fix what it means and the general conception of it instead of dropping the word. Yeah. But let's see, maybe we change our minds. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. There's, there's some few comments also coming up in the chat. Um, I also want to add something to this discussion. Like not in all countries, they use the word uh, intersectionality. Like, for example, in the Netherlands, in the vegan movement, I don't hear that word all the time. Also, sometimes people talk about identity politics. So, they, you know, they use a different word. Um, and I think sometimes it's not necessarily that people are against intersectionality, but more against the idea that all oppressions matter and that they are connected. What you also said in the introduction. So um, that is... Um, so that's a broader a broader issue actually but let me look at what comes in the um so the first person is anna she wanted to say something so anna go ahead please yeah i just wanted to add that um for example the people that i follow followed on social media and strongly identified with the word intersectional uh i disagreed with a lot of their posts um that felt like they're calling people out and they're shaming people and for example they were just saying that these people are bad because they never post about this or never post about that like it felt like they're concentrating their attention on like calling out other people and i think that's why i was like hesitant to use exactly this word Maybe it's just a few people who are very loud that give it a bad name and it does, it's not representative, but these are just what I was confronted with. Yeah, this is 1 million percent true, I think. Uh, and finally, I'm going to come to that in a little bit, actually, what those who say that, that they're intersectional, what they're doing wrong, in my opinion. And uh, finally, actually, exactly because of this, I think I tend to highlight sometimes more uh, that I'm into pro-intersectional than I actually am, uh, specifically for this reason, because I want to show people that you can be pro-intersectional and you don't have to post screenshots. It's really not necessary. <laughs> uh, I think this is slowly being forgotten and we have this association that an intersectional is going to exclude people, shame people, take your screenshots to a degree that I think even within intersection intersectionals, I think that, they're, have become, that they've become shyer in just saying what they think because there has been this culture of calling each other out. And so I, I couldn't agree more, yeah. Okay. There's some other people in the chat. Uh, Yolanda says, it's the first time I hear about this uh, resistance about the word and the concept. So uh, that's, a, that's a different experience. And then also someone says, uh, Tina, uh, definitely this is an international topic. In Canada, it's a big discussion in the AR movement uh, then also in portugal people see it as a progressive idea in france as well as least a few people that speak about it not everyone knows what it is and then last one is yes in canada it's a divide in the movement i think some people think feel that the concept is used to make excuses for some people to not be vegan mm -hmm. so already quite some discussion i would say maybe you want to just go ahead with your presentation and uh, keep some discussion also for after the presentation. Yeah. Okay, cool. Perfect, yeah. I think we're almost done. Um, all right, so why doesn't everyone identify as pro-intersectional? Uh, and I think Anna touched upon an important component of that. Um, but I wanna start by asking like, why do we do vegan outreach, right? I mean, if we do it because a lot of people don't agree with veganism. And even though it's so fucking obvious, right? We do it because a lot of people aren't aware of their species privilege. A lot of people aren't aware that animals are suffering and some deny that animals even can suffer, 
right? And so we want to convince people otherwise. And so we do outreach, right? And yet outreach is not always easy because it can be frustrating when people don't want to hear the message. We get angry, right? And we tend to even dislike people who don't get it. And people who say shit like, oh, veganism is extreme. Most of us have very negative feelings and we probably don't react in the best way. Um, and I think this is a phenomenon that was maybe more prevalent in the past. Um, and we have learned from it, right? But still, this is probably also part of why we have and had so many workshops on effective communication, effective advocacy, nonviolent communication within animal rights, right? Why? Because without that, we probably suck at it, right? Like we probably got angry and like shouted at people, especially maybe in the first years of uh, animal rights. Uh, we made probably a lot of mistakes. Um, and that of course comes also with the motivation of changing people's minds, but mixed with frustration, it can go really wrong. Um, but we now have our community, you know, we have our documentaries, we have our vegan friends, at least a lot of us have this online connection with other vegans to a degree where I think we have this huge community. And so personally, I suggest that this phenomenon of the angry vegan uh, has been replaced by this phenomenon of the angry intersectional. You know, um, is every intersectional an angry intersectional person? No, not every angry, like not, uh, sorry, not every vegan is an angry vegan either, right? So not all intersectionals are angry, but like Anna already said, when you're angry, you tend to be very loud. And when you're very loud, you tend to overshadow the work that other people are doing. And so we're still repairing, I think to a big degree, the damage that angry vegans have caused in the past and i think it's reason there's reason to worry that we're going to do the same mistake with intersectionality and i think this is why i have this urgency to talk and uh, not only to people who are against intersectionality but also people who are uh, defending and advocating for intersection for an intersectional approach and that is because like like i said anna already mentioned i think the criticism for example that intersectionals receive often is very justified, right? Like shaming, uh, the list is long, but like shaming, online bullying, or blocking each other on social media, calling each other out, screenshots, uh, an obsession with language, uh, scoring points by finding a mistake in the other one, and moral perfectionism, or assuming that like you are more woke than the other one, uh, a lack of dialogue <laughs> and really awful skills at giving uh, constructive negative feedback. I think this criticism is absolutely justified and everyone who ident identifies with pro-intersectionality has to think about this and has to improve uh, the communication of how we do this. We might get angry, but we have to be careful. And so I think this kind of communication that some of us tend to have, including maybe myself sometimes, cannibalizes the movement, you know? We need more people to come on board, to feel safe and to feel included. And yet, what are we doing? We sometimes do the opposite, you know? Um, and doo -doo -doo -doo. another important uh, part of all of this is, of course, diversity and inclusion, right? We want uh, more people to go vegan uh, and we want more people to become active, right? And so I want to uh, give you a little thought experiment. So imagine you are white and male, if you already aren't, <laughs> if you are just stick to it. But just imagine you're white male, right? And you fall into this category. And then there's a basketball game and they announce in this game that everybody's welcome to join. Everybody who wants to play can play, you know, but you look at the field and it's just women playing. So most likely you will interpret this like, oh, by everyone they mean women because clearly I'm not gonna go there as the single man and play there, right? Or let's say there is a protest outside. There's a huge demonstration. You're a white, black, uh, white male and you see this protest and it's women all wearing headscarves, all of them, right? And actually, the demonstration maybe is against animal agriculture. 
But what is the likelihood of this white male looking at that and being like, you know what? I want to be part of this community. I can relate to this message and I'm going to go to every action and I'm going to be consistently contributing to their cause. Is it likely? You know? And this is a little bit why there's so much drama around decentering whiteness, you know? I mean, do you now under feel why we need to decenter whiteness? in the movement, not to eradicate it, but stop centering it, you know, because as long as we center it, we are going to cause a lot of people, in fact, the majority of the global population to not identify with what we're doing. And so sometimes I guess the drama around decentering white people is not the concept itself, but sometimes the drama and conflict comes from the problem of we don't know how to do it. You know, you might be like, I wanted to talk at this uh, event, am I not going to talk because I'm white? But that's discrimination as well. And this kind of drama around it of how we're going to do it. And I want to give you an example of why diversity and uh, inclusivity is so majorly important and we really, really cannot avoid talking about this. And I'm going to give you specific examples from the environmental movement. And the numbers that I'm going to use are from the US. But that's because in the US, there are numbers about this. I wish there were more numbers from other areas and also about animal rights, but I think we can take this in and probably learn something from it that we can apply to animal rights. People of color in environmental organizations. Look at this. Interns hosted in the last three years within environmental organizations, 22.5%. And by the way, this is in the US, and remember in the US, 40% of the population is our people of color, our people who are not considered white. Only 22.5% were interns. Staff hired in the last three years, 12.8%. Paid staff members, 12%. And members of the board, leadership positions, 4.6%. That's really, really sad. <laughs> And I look at, for example, participation in political activities. Uh, so consumer, act consumer activism, I think is something we can relate to, right? Protests, attending political meetings. You can see that white people are more present than any other uh, social group in terms of ethnicity, right? Black people go less, Asian Americans go less, and Latinos as well. Sad, you know, they're not as represented in the political arena of environmental justice. What would you assume? you would assume that they care less, right? It's the opposite. When they asked about global warming being a top priority or not, non-white people answered that much more that they care. And one of the explanations for this is because mostly in society, people who actually contribute least to social problems are those who are affected most by it. You know, and so people from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds are much more likely to be also affected by climate change. They know that they're going to be the first to, to drown. And so they are actually much more scared. And you can see this in the numbers here as well, in terms of alarmed, concerned, cautious, etc. And so, for example, it's very interesting to see that non-Latinos, 18% alarmed. English-speaking Latinos, 29%, and Spanish-speaking Latinos, 37%. And I find this fascinating because I think if you ask a random person if someone, uh, a Latino in America who doesn't even speak English, if they care about climate change, I think most people will say they don't even know about climate change. In fact, they're the most alarmed about climate change. Right? And I think these numbers are really important for us to understand the assumptions that we're sometimes making. It might, the, the opposite might be true. And what's the idea behind diversity and inclusion? Why does this come up so often? And why do we really, really have to take this as a criteria for our advocacy? And I'm putting here in front of you the uh, world population. Because the idea is that white folks made up, make up 15% of the global population, you know? Like look at Asia and Africa. 
you know so uh imagine if we got every single white person on this planet to go vegan we're still stuck at 15 percent you know and this is exactly why we're talking so much about decentering white people you know because we have a global population that is not dominantly white, upper middle class, and drinks kale smoothies, right? And so we have to introduce into our activism and the work we do things that people can relate to, that the majority of the world can relate to. And here one more, just to put this into perspective. China, India, you know, then comes US. But I also want to highlight, for example, the countries here and how many of them are European or Western uh, or North American. Like we have China, India, US, Indonesia, Brazil, Pakistan, Nigeria, Bangladesh, Russia, Japan, Mexico, Philippines, Egypt. Look at this list. Look at the global population and what we're doing. You know, I feel like sometimes we're like in the small bubble where we're hoping that everybody there is going to go vegan and when they do, we look at the world and we go like, oh shit, there are a lot more people around that we never actually targeted and or included. Um, and just a few last words. So I just want to say that apart from convincing people to go vegan, right? Like who are the people most likely to do activism? You know, like people who are already in some way concerned with justice, who are suffering from injustice or who have joined a movement Know, are much more likely to probably get our message. And, like, um, and so, for example, I want, to, I want people to relate to the phenomenon of like, how long are you going to last in an environmental group, for example, where everybody walks around with a meat sandwich? Now, how long are you going to last? How frustrated are you gonna get? Okay, you think the group is great and their environmental work is great, but they're all eating dead animals and they won't even listen when you say, please, you know, consider animal rights, please. And they don't listen. We don't last in these groups. And I think the same is also true vice versa, you know? So um, when we get annoyed about another group not understanding the oppression that we're fighting against, how do feminists and anti-racists and environmentalists feel towards us if we don't consider the advocacy that they do? They're not going to expect that we focus and primarily center ourselves around their advocacy. But how likely is that a feminist is going to identify, an environmentalist is going to identify some of the people who are most likely to actually join us? How long are they going to last if we do not consider the oppression or the justice that they are fighting for or against? You know, and so I think considering this will transform us in not only in quantity, but obviously also in quality, right? We, uh, we are not going to only be more activists and more vegans, but we will create a safer and more effective, consistent, and most importantly, just and equal movement. And so, yeah, I mean, the goal of this talk is basically to open your hearts and minds to intersectionality, but also to a type of intersectionality or pro-intersectionality that is inviting to people and not excluding uh, people. And I hope it gave you a lens uh, towards the world and uh, that it leads to more compassion in our advocacy and to including, like I said, more people. Thank you.